But Thomas. But Thomas. The one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and see my hands. And reach here your hand, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. <clears throat> I have a friend who planted a church, an Anglican church in London a number of years ago. And it has the most interesting name, especially for an Anglican church. It is simply called Tommy's. With the idea, as that has happened still many times, people ask him, my friend Paul, and others at the church, what's with this name of this church? And then they have the opportunity to respond with something like this. Well, you see, there's this chap in the Bible who had all sorts of questions, all sorts of doubts, quite a serious level of skepticism about Jesus. And his name was Tommy. Well, Tom. Well, actually, Thomas. And then they would go on, what about you? Do you have questions, doubts? Skepticism even about this Jesus, about God, about faith, about culture, about the world around us. Do you have serious questions? If so, this church is just for you and that's why we call it Tommy's. I'd go to a church like that. I wanted to start with Thomas and his encounter with Jesus precisely for this reason at the beginning of this week together to welcome you, all of you and some of you particularly, to explore Jesus again with all your doubts, your questions, fears, and even skepticism, honestly acknowledged, even as you consider Jesus again. I love how Philip Yancey puts it in reference to the importance of the Incarnation when he says, In Jesus, God lay down, as it were, on thy dissection table, stretched out in cruciform posture for the scrutiny of all skeptics that have ever lived, including me. Including me including all my friends in Scotland who are full of questions, full of doubts, full of deep skepticism about this Jesus we lift up so high, especially amongst Muslims who are coming to faith and huge questions about Jesus Christ. Who is he? 
his claims. I think this particular gospel narrative accounting for Thomas's penultimate encounter with Jesus, he meets Jesus yet one more time in John's Gospel, but this is the penultimate time, offers us, I think, three hugely important observations as we consider Jesus. First, we cannot escape this passage and it offers us some pretty serious warnings along the way. And although we want to invite honest doubts, questions, even levels of skepticism, the passage does give us some warnings that I would be unfair to the text if I skip over. Second, though it's largely about total encouragement for skeptics, for those with underlying fears and doubts about this Jesus. And then third, a conclusive Christ centered climax that's vital to faith. Today we will likely get through only the first of those. I could see the fear in your eyes. Only the first and then pick up the second and third when we come back tomorrow to this very same passage. As I say, although this passage I believe is largely affirming, welcoming of honest questioning, honest skepticism, I do not think that we can overlook clear elements in the text that serve as quite serious warnings along the way in the path of faith that we call following Jesus. At least two such, what we could easily refer to as subtle warnings, are neatly tucked into the very first mention of Thomas in the passage in verse 24. So look with me at verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The Gospel writer John first supplies a rather critical set of details when he wants us to know that Thomas was, he reminds us, one of the twelve. Do you see that in verse 24? With the narrative power of suggestion, it is not at all incidental that the only other person the only other person in all of John's Gospel that is referred to this way is, guess who? None other than Judas Iscariot. The one amongst the twelve who betrayed Jesus. We see this, for example, in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 71. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Many New Testament scholars, and I think rightly, see this suggestive reference as deliberately invoking the same. Suggesting, in other words, that Thomas could easily be headed for a similar, but perhaps different type of betrayal of Christ himself. Oh, not overt, not for money, not malicious like unto Judas, but with a similar level of seriousness, perhaps betraying his love and loyalty to Christ because of two traits that we see recurring in the life of Thomas throughout John's Gospel, fear and unbelief. Two traits that Jesus really warns us about, to live a life a faith that is more about fear and a life characterized by unbelief.
Or as Jesus himself puts it to Thomas in verse 27, if you look at 27, the issue of his anti-belief, apistos, against faith rather than pistos, faith living and active, living in such a way that you are anti-faith. The other little detail, and that John wants us to know, as he has before in his gospel, two other times, that this Thomas, again back in verse 24, is the one called Didymus, translated as twin. And again, New Testament scholars rightly wonder if this is more than an interesting biological affirmation, that Thomas has some unnamed twin brother or sister lurking in the background. It's kind of odd that that would have any significance. Added to a purely biological description, it is meant as evocative, invoking the corollary figure of Judas once more, who is like a twin to Thomas. As a twin of sorts in unbelief, and liable to at least emotional and spiritual betrayal. The second of these more subtle warnings is in verse 24. Again, all packed in these little details in verse 24 right at the very end of it, when John specifically wants us to know, isn't it interesting that Thomas was not with them? when Jesus came after his resurrection. He means, of course, that Thomas was noticeably absent when Jesus, both materially and supernaturally, appeared to the disciples with such post-resurrection importance recorded in the previous verse when he tells them, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. It's quite an important truth for followers of Jesus, the church, to embrace. But Thomas is not with them. And again, scholars have given serious attention to why John includes this curious detail. Why is that important for you to know as you read this gospel? It is quite possibly a type of insider alerting that Thomas was already in the process of withdrawing from relationship with other people. Christ followers, other disciples. It is, in other words, a warning about the danger of isolation or moving onto that island that is so lonely called the island of aloneness. And I stress this because I've met students all around the world, but particularly my experience at Chehi, where students like yourselves, faculty like yourselves, people like me, Graham, and each of us, with serious questions and doubts and even certain levels of skepticism, and we feel constrained to handle it all on the island of aloneness because we cannot honestly express them in a community that will say, bring them on. What are your questions? Let's talk about that. The church has not done a very good job, largely, of saying any question is okay. Your doubts can be part of a growing faith. Skepticism is not all bad, depending on where it goes. As a result of what I would call mishandling 
questions, doubts, skepticism. Young men and women, and even those of you in the faculty and staff, when we have honest doubts, questions, even serious skepticism, we should not isolate ourselves out of fear of condemnation. Certainly not from Jesus, and hopefully, hopefully not from his followers. I'm so sorry, young men, young women, when you have had honest questions and doubts, and somebody in our community has said, you don't have the right to ask that. That's apostasy. That's out of question. As we'll see, Jesus welcomes these questions from Thomas. But rather we embrace relational community, friends, fellow spiritual pilgrims, healthy church, and places like, for me, the Chehi Summer School of Music, where you can address and seriously tackle your doubts, your questions in an honest but loving, grace-filled environment. But I think John is warning us about this right here in this subtle little phrase, Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. For some reason, he felt he needed to deal with his doubts all by himself. But Jesus wouldn't allow for it. Jesus in his love and grace would not allow Thomas's questions to be outside the community but embrace them as we'll see tomorrow. Finally, the text quite starkly has a word to say to us about a rather strident form of disbelief. There is honest questioning and even skepticism, but when it becomes a strident anti-belief, there is potential problem and warning. We see this really quite blatantly in verse 25, if you look at it with me. When Thomas's response to the news of the other disciples that they have seen the Lord, this is his response, I will not believe unless I shall see his hands in the imprint of the nails, put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe, it is the Greek negation grammar, ou me pistuso, which is really better translated like this, certainly not will I believe. Ou me pistuso, certainly not will I believe. It is demonstrating for us, you see, in Thomas, the potential at least of a stridency of disbelief and it is here too as a warning. There is what I call a biblical welcome to questioning, doubting, honest skepticism that is very humbly postured and thus sincere and honestly disturbed when platitudes of faith don't seem to add up for you. But John's gospel perhaps intends a warning to a level of disbelief that is erroneously placed and betrayed by its arrogance and stridency. Certainly not. And so, we're going to end here today. And tomorrow, come back to this critical passage, leaving you with these warnings in mind, and yet to engage tomorrow with really the heart of the passage, a huge encouragement that is meant to offer encouragement to humble and sincere skeptics.
and to engage then with its powerful climax. But in prelude to that, and in wanting to sincerely begin this week by welcoming you to consider and explore Jesus again, with all of your doubts, your questions, your fears, your even a level of skepticism, honestly acknowledge, and I tell you, we welcome them. And so I want to conclude this morning by inviting you. There's a sheet of paper that was on your chair. And you're welcome. You're not required, but I invite you to take that. It's from the school where I teach. Just free paper, so I took it. Um, no, no advert intended. Um, and if you would like to write any sort of doubt, any sort of burden, any sort of problem in the Bible for you, any sort of question, any sort of, this makes me skeptical. Could be anything. Put it on that. You don't have to sign it, and I'll do my best either to address those. If you want me to try to speak to those in these sessions, I will somehow slide them in. Or I would even prefer you come to me and say, Wesley, I'd love to talk about this question. And we uh, go get a coffee and chat it over. Or you go to, even better yet, these wonderful counselors and their staff under Lorden, who really are so happy to engage with you. But I want you to know I'm really available. And uh, I think questioning, doubting is a healthy part of a growing faith if it's handled well. And I will receive those from you in such a loving, graceful spirit. Let's just look at what the Bible says. Let's look at a theological perspective that's maybe broader uh, than you've had before, or whatever it might be. Let's pray. Let's get to know this Jesus. It's amazing Jesus of the Gospels, not the one maybe you have known, but consider Jesus again. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to give you just a few minutes to write a question if you want. Just leave it on your chair and we'll collect them, or if you want to take time to write those out, like go away and really think about it. Uh, Lauren and, and the counseling staff have a, I think, a beautifully decorated box that we will put here and then, or in the dining area. And you can just slip it in there. Just be honest, you know, you don't have to be embarrassed. Like sometimes people want to slip that in, nobody see you have a question. How ridiculous is that? Just be honest, bring it forth. And that's how we'll handle it. And if you on your paper you want to say, yes, Wesley, I'd love to meet you, then I'll set up a coffee time. All the hardest questions, I will divert to the Queen of Chehi. <laughs> as long as I oversee her. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for Tommy's. That church is amazing. I love it all built around this idea, who is this Tommy who had fears and apistas, disbelief, skepticism, and how we see at the end of this story what you did, Lord Jesus, to embrace him. We're so grateful that we can be honest in our faith. I thank you for these students and as they excel in music, they're so often like others I find around the world. Their minds are active and they excel in many things, including the hard questions of faith. So I pray you'd bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Take uh, like two minutes now. Can we just have it quiet for two minutes? And if you want to write out a